thanks so much for joining us this morning. I know it's a bit early. Um, we really appreciate it. My name is Searsha Hinksman. I'm the marketing manager here at SmartBear for AlertSite. Um, and I have Dennis with me, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Dennis Goodwin. I am the product owner for the AlertSite product line here at SmartBear. Uh, we'll go into what's new. Um, we announced the open API specification support in alert site today. So we're super excited about it. Um, we're going to take you guys through what that looks like, what sort of things you can do, how you can reuse your open, spe open API specification files. Um, and we'll go ahead and get started. So today we're going to go over um, a little bit about alert site, just in case for those of you who are on the webinar who don't aren't as familiar with alert site as we are. Um, we'll go over the platform, we'll go over um, our API monitoring capabilities in general, and then we'll delve into how you can use your open API specification files to monitor APIs in alert site. Um, then we'll open up the floor for questions. Um, there's a Q&A and a chat button um, or feature in Zoom. So if at any time you guys feel like there's something that you wanna know, just shoot that in there and then we can cover the questions at the end. So I'm sure you guys are somewhat familiar with this. This is a software development lifecycle. Um, and typically you'll see monitoring systems um, placed toward the end of the software development lifecycle. So more towards deploy or maintain. Um, but today we're going to talk about how you can sort of integrate monitoring into um, earlier stages of the lifecycle, such as design. So you can reuse your OAS files um, that you create in the design phase um, and take that through all the way towards the end of deployment or maintaining those systems. So I'll hand it over to Dennis if you want to go ahead and explain the alert site platform and introduce yourself a little bit, maybe give a little bit of background of who you are. Sure. Um, morning, everybody. I am Dennis Goodwin. I'm the product owner for alert site here at Smart Bear. So I'm uh, I'm very familiar with alert site and, and you know, I'm less familiar with um, open API and swagger and things like that. But that I think makes me actually a good person to do this because I can kind of show you um, how easy it's to, how easy it is to use uh, for really anybody who has access to um, these open API uh, definitions or, or, or swagger definitions. So uh, before we get to that though, um, a quick, very quick overview of AlertSite. Uh, so AlertSite is the monitoring product uh, here at SmartBear. And um, it's a synthetic monitoring platform. It can monitor web APIs from around the world um, or from any location that, that you want to deploy your own uh, monitoring node to. So it's, it's very flexible from a deployment standpoint. Um, and it's very flexible from an actual monitoring standpoint in terms of what can be monitored um, and how you can create those monitors. So we can easily create web monitors, we can easily create API monitors, whether it's reusing SOAP UI test cases or um, what we're gonna show today, which is um, a native API monitor created in the alert site console. Uh, and for today, we're, we're specifically looking at creating that API monitor from a, an existing uh, open API definition. So alert site is the monitoring platform, you know, from which we, we run these, these scheduled um, transactions from, from wherever is important to you, from around the world. And um, we have a web console. We've got a very robust alerting um, and reporting capability as well. So you can get the information from the alert side platform out to whoever in your organization uh, should be getting it. And you can kind of see that on the top. Like we, I literally just took a screenshot of what the alert site um, platform looks like. So this is exactly what you'll see. Um, and you can see at the top, you have options for um, charting, reports, alerts, um, and they're super configurable. So you can make sure that whoever needs to get them and whoever doesn't need to get them um, is sent appropriately. So those people are receiving them or not receiving them. Yeah, and just you know, as an aside, the not receiving them part is is pretty important sometimes. Once you have a, a lot of people uh, in the pool of alert recipients, you definitely uh, need that capability. Otherwise, you get a lot of unhappy people at two in the morning when things go south on an app that they don't care about, uh, which does happen more than you think. Um, so yeah, and we'll take a look at that console live in, in, in a little bit. So 
All right, let's, uh, why don't we jump over to, I think we're gonna talk a little bit more about API monitoring. So, so to give you a context of um, what AlertSight does for APIs in general, before we jump into the, uh, the specific open API part of this, um, our, our monitoring in general tells you a, a few things about um, whatever it is that we're monitoring, whether it's web or API. Uh, we tell you if it's available, uh, we tell you if it's functionally correct, and that's really a, a critical element. Um, we're not just talking about pinging an endpoint and getting back a 200 okay message. We're making sure that the, the API of the website is doing exactly what it is uh, that you expect it to, um, whether it's a single endpoint or website or web page that you're looking at or a multi-step transaction that requires you know, context from the, from the previous steps to, to continue forward. Um, so the functional correctness is, is critical and the ability to test that functional correctness every time the monitor runs uh, is a very important aspect of, of the AlertSight platform. Uh, and then finally, you know, we look at performance as well. So we're able to baseline performance and then, you know, alert on, on deviations from, from those baselines. So uh, it's not just about whether it's working, but whether it's working fast enough, because if it's not working fast enough, it's not working. Uh, and everybody knows that. And with you know mobile apps uh, and and the high expectations on web pages these days, uh, performance is just as important as the actual functionality itself. If you don't have both, uh, you're going to lose you're going to lose users every time. So, from that perspective, you know API monitoring and web monitoring are very similar. Um, what we do with um, with API monitoring though is is we allow you to easily reuse um, the assets that you already have. So like we said, if you're using SOAP UI to do your testing um, of your APIs, we can uh, you know, automatically take any test case from any project in SOAP UI, uh, or if you use Ready API, the, the commercial product, um, we can take those projects, they can be imported either from SOAP UI or Ready API or from AlertSight, doesn't matter, you can import or, or direct upload from the, uh, from the plugins. Um, in the, uh, in the desktop apps, uh, you can take that test case and you can make it a monitor in a matter of seconds. So, so the reuse story there is, is very strong. Um, if you're not using SOAP UI, then we have the ability to create API monitors uh, directly from the alert site console, and that's what I'm gonna show you in a, in a minute. Um, and you know, that allows you to manually create an endpoint monitor or to reuse uh, your open API um, definition. So the reuse uh, aspect of things comes into play here as well. Um, what we're trying to do is make it easy, um, you know, to, to take advantage of what you've already done uh, and get those monitors created as quickly as possible. And what we have on the uh, right side of the screen is literally what you would see. So we showed you um, in the slide before this, a picture of a screenshot of what the alert site platform would look like in your browser. Um, and on the right hand side, that's literally what you would see in terms of like getting a quick, um, trying to get a quick understanding of like how your APIs are performing. So that little tile will represent all of um, the performance, availability benchmarks, and then you can delve a little bit deeper and get some more metrics, um, a little bit more detailed metrics into how that run went and how the API um, is actually behaving in real life or real time. <laughs> and then let me scooch on over. All right. All right, so um, just to kind of round out, you know, the open API uh, specification. So, SmartBear, um, you know, is is the company behind Swagger, and you know we're very strong supporters, obviously, of of the, you know, the Open API specification um, and and the use of it kind of in in the broader API ecosystem. Um, and what you know Swagger is is you know essentially um, or the Open API uh, specification allows you to define your APIs, make it really easy to to use them across your organization in, in a consistent, you know, scalable way. And uh, it, it really just makes them um, easy to create, easy to disseminate, uh, easy to manage, and, and, you know, really easy to keep everybody, you know, on the same page uh, to know what's going on with the APIs, where they are, and, and how you can use them. Um, so that's, you know, that's my open API <laughs> shtick. And also aside from that, um, 
you know, these formats are really easy for um, an end user or consumer of your API to understand how they're supposed to interact or work with this API. So it's super important that you make everything um, standardized and consistent and make it makes it easier for um, really everybody to understand what your API is supposed to be doing and how you can interact with it in the best possible way. And so um, what's key about this here is that it'll this by using this specification, so taking um, your designs from from development all the way through to deployment, it really sets um, a key element of standardization across your company, right? On top of having it be consistent um, and having it be a little bit more efficient, a little bit easier for people to work together um, if you're using the same artifact. So it's a little bit more collaborative. All right, Dennis, I'll hand it over to you if Actually, you want to. Oh. Let me see. Oh, no, we're going to talk about that on the way out. Okay. <laughs> Awesome. I thought we had one more slide. All right. Yeah, so we'll take a look at how you actually do it in real life. It's super easy, very simple. Even I can do it, which is something to be said. If you can do it, I don't know why I'm doing the demo. Ah. I should just be doing color commentary. <laughs> All right. There's my screen. Okay, so uh, as uh, as Sersha mentioned earlier, um, this is the uh, this is the console that we had in the screenshot before. This is um, a live view of, of my machine. Um, so what you see here, I'll give you a quick overview of alert set before we jump into the, uh, the monitor creation part of it. Um, what you see here is a, a dashboard that is showing you a tile for a, a group of monitors that I put together. So this is 12 monitors from my account, which I think has about 75 or something in it. Um, the, this dashboard is very customizable. You can choose whether you're in um, day or night mode. Sometimes you'll see the screenshots are white. Sometimes they're black. I'm a big fan of the the, the knock mode, as I like to call it, or the or the night mode. Um, but you can change the colors. You can change the time frames you're looking at. You can control which monitors um, you're looking looking at at any given time. Uh, we have tiles uh, that will aggregate a group of monitors uh, into a single view. Those can be added as well. But for the sake of simplicity, I created a, a pretty basic view. It's a collection of um, web and API monitors. And you can see that they're all running pretty well, except for this first one. Um, and this is actually a monitor I created yesterday, um, recording a, a video of, of some of this same material. Um, and it, it's a monitor I created from uh, an open API spec. And I'll, I'm going to do more or less the same thing in a second. But you can see it's been having some trouble compared to the other monitors. This was actually not done on purpose to highlight any of the alert set capabilities. Uh, it turns out that the uh, the API uh, backend that I used, uh, apparently uh, unbeknownst to me, has some issues, both with people messing with the data and with some uh, availability issues with the server. So uh, I have a variety of errors that uh, we'll, we'll show you in a sec. Um, that was unplanned, but I think, uh, you know, kind of, convenient for what we're trying to do here today. Um, we don't have time to go into alert site in great detail. So if there's any interest in um, seeing more or trying it out, uh, it's very easy to set up a trial. Um, we'll have information on that, I'm sure, in the, uh, the follow-up emails. Um, but it's very prominent on our uh, on our on our website, you can get smartpay.com and, and <laughs> find alert site. Uh, I don't think you can avoid the uh, trial button. Uh, so, uh, so feel free to give it a shot. You can reach out to us directly as well. Um, but I'm going to kind of keep it at, the, at a very high level on the overall alert set story. But the bottom line is the web console, highly configurable, lets you see what you got to do. Uh, I'll show you a little bit about monitor creation now, but also behind this is a very robust capability for um, creating, you know, outbound reports and alerts. Um, and you know, really let you get you know the information about these monitors into the right the right hands. So, um, so I'm gonna see here. I'm thinking about this. You know what? Let's uh, before we jump to the monitor creation, um, let's take a look at when this monitor first kind of went south on us. Um, so <laughs> if you click into that time segment, you'll see that we've got some really good results, some greens here, right? And then things went. Things went red at about you know, 138 or so um, yesterday. So this was after I created the monitor in the morning. So 
what we can do here is you see we've got this um, JSON path match failure, which is exciting error code, but um, it does tell us that we're not getting what we thought we'd get. And I'll show you how to create um, that assertion uh, when we create the, the new monitor. But basically, uh, we can go in here and we can kind of look at the captures from both a successful and a failed run. And if we go down here to the response, we can see that I'm, and I know what I'm looking for because I created the monitor. Um, but I'm looking for a, a pet with the name Doggy, and I'll explain this pet store thing in a second. Um, but what came back is uh, Doggy with a few extra letters on there. And like I said, uh, somebody has access to the actual database that these APIs hit up against and change the name of my dog to uh, Doggy U. And that caused the assertion to fail, which caused the monitor to fail. So you get a little quick view of how alert site rolls um, from, from that example. Uh, and that's really just you know, kind of what alert sites all about in terms of um, you know, surfacing these errors in real time. And in this case, this is a functional correctness failure. Um, wasn't an issue with availability of the API, wasn't an issue with performance. It was actually a failure of the API to do what we expected it to do. So, so that's our lightning alert site console demo. Um, now let's kind of show you how you create an, a or an API monitor uh, from an existing, as an existing specification. So we go to add new and monitor, and you'll see we have a variety of monitor types here. Um, we're gonna focus on the API side of the house. And, and as I said earlier, you can upload a SOAP UI project uh, from this console, right from the, the second button on the screen here. We are not gonna go through that workflow today, um, but that's as simple as clicking that button, uh, grabbing the, uh, the file and, and picking the test case you wanna monitor. Uh, in this case, we're gonna actually create a single API endpoint monitor ourselves. And it's a pretty straightforward interface. Um, it was uh, modeled kind of in parallel with the uh, Swagger Inspector um, UI, which uh, was just recently released as well. And this interface is fairly new. We updated this from uh, our previous single endpoint API monitoring. Uh, it was based on our web uh, up down monitor and we've uh, we've updated it now to be to be much more API centric uh, so it uses a lot of the same playback technologies that that soap UI does uh, but it it's a it's a much more straightforward you know web based interface that just kind of gets to the key things you need to create a monitor and, and we're going to keep building on this um, in 2018 as well but the most recent addition is this ability to create an endpoint monitor from an open API or swagger definition so you can manually enter in anything you want related to a get or a post. Um, you can put header and parameter values, authentication values. So all that um, information can be manually entered. But what we're going to talk about today is the ability to create a monitor from an existing definition. So I have my uh, petstore.swagger.io um, swagger definition here. So I'm going to load that up. And what that's going to do is give me all of the available API uh, calls that, that can be made um, you know, from that definition. So from here, I don't have to worry about what the URL is. I don't have to worry necessarily about the structure of the call. Um, I can just go ahead and, and you know, pick the endpoint I want to monitor. And I'm kind of off to the races at that point. So we're going to, we're going to choose uh, this you know, find pet by status. And you'll see that we have a, you know, a single parameter in the header. So if we go over to the parameter section, we see status. And all we have to do is enter in a valid code. And I've happened to have figured out that status equals one will, will get, me some, get me something I'm looking for here. Um, if you're more familiar with the API and the definitions, obviously it'll be very straightforward to create the calls with, with the right parameters um, and, and go from there. Um, I'm kind of a newbie, which was, again, sort of the point of all this. So. Um, so we've created our call. We're going to do a simple get to the pet store and get back um, pets with the uh, status of one. So we click validate, and we're going to make a call uh, right from alert site and get back our, our payload. And you see here that the uh, name equals doggy appears um, similar to the, the proper running monitor that we saw earlier. Um, and from here, you can... Um, 
create the assertions that you want right from this, this call. So uh, that is pretty much everything you need to create a monitor um, you know, from that endpoint. And then we move on from the call itself to the monitor configuration screen. And, and this is a subset of the monitor parameters that you can control in AlertSight. Uh, we've, we've chosen kind of the, the, the basic ones that you'll want to look at um, when you first set up the monitor. Um, the actual configuration edit interface has a whole lot more going on. But for the sake of uh, monitor creation, we tried to keep it pretty clean. So you give your, um, you give your monitor a name. Uh, and then you can, you can choose the, the monitoring interval. Um, you can set some basic timeout parameters around how long it should take before the monitor fails. Um, we have a variety of uh, monitoring modes. And this gets to whether or not we will uh, retry um, in the case of a failure, and we can retry locally, and we can retry from another location um, in our network. And I'll talk about the locations in a second, but they're uh, kind of uh, given away by the map there on the right. Um, so we have a lot of ability to decide um, whether that monitor is, is failing or not. And that's very important when you're trying to keep the, the noise of false alarms to a minimum, but you really want to ensure that you know everything is working, but you want to you want to also avoid bothering people um, unnecessarily. So there's a lot of ways in our system to control uh, how often the monitor runs, what has to happen before it's deemed to be a failure, and and then on the alerting side, we have even more controls at the alert recipient level to determine the threshold uh, that has to be reached before that alert is going to be sent to that person. So, so there's a, a bunch of, a bunch of layers to this. Um, it's pretty sophisticated. It's also pretty straightforward in terms of configuration. Um, and you know, you can, you can generally, you know, find that sweet spot of just enough sensitivity with, with enough, um, you know, kind of wiggle room as well to, to avoid it being too noisy. Um, so that is kind of, um, the deal with with the monitor configuration um, you can also um, you know set this to rotate through a bunch of locations um, and it can run from one location each cycle so if you're going every five minutes from five locations every five minutes it's going to hit one of the locations or you can you know ramp it up and run from multiple locations every every interval and in that case you know you might choose to run every five minutes from five locations and every five minutes you're going to go to all five of those and again um, We've alluded to the locations. This is our public network. And um, you can see that we've got, you know, locations around the world. Uh, let's see, we'll add, you know, we can add a couple from uh, say Boston and Calgary, in addition to Fort Lauderdale and Austin, Texas. Um, really quickly, we have a, a hybrid deployment model in our platform, which allows you, and we alluded to that in the, in the intro slide, but you can create a monitor that runs from our public network you can also add your own monitoring nodes, and they can be either uh, physical or virtual servers, or you can um, install a lightweight desktop agent, and we'll actually run the monitors through that agent on your um, any machine in your network. So regardless of where you want to monitor from and whether your apps are public-facing or internal, uh, we have the ability to, to get to that endpoint and, and do the monitoring. Uh, so there's no issue there as far as locations go. So Dennis, how many monitors would you recommend, or at least locations wise, would you recommend per like um, um, API monitor? If you're monitoring publicly, um, I, I like to have at least four or five locations that are geographically kind of spread. Um, sometimes, you know, you may be US based or you may be global. So it, it, it kind of depends on what geographies you care about. But there's a lot of value in monitoring from from multiple locations. Um, it doesn't cost more because you can you can have it rotate through. So so the real the the real you know implication on on you know cost and and consumption of um, the measurements you purchase is is the uh, the concurrency of the the runs, the frequency and the concurrency. Um, but there's nothing that stops you from running from you know. You know, you can run from 50 locations if you want. You want to really see what's going on. Um, but 
definitely it's a best practice to run from at least four or five locations for sure. Um, we have some customers who they, they say they only care about one place, but you know, that one place can have issues that have nothing to do with either alert sites platform or the application being monitored. Um, we're still sitting there on the open internet. There's still an ISP involved. There's still a host in that data center running our node. Um, all those things can have problems. So there's a lot of value in spreading the load across uh, our whole network. So, so that's generally best practice as well. So once you get this configuration um, to your liking, then really the only uh, step after that is to click, you know, start monitoring and you are kind of off to the races at that point. So, uh, and within a few minutes, you know, those initial monitors will fire off and you'll start getting uh, results uh, in the dashboard like we had here. So that's um, that's the Lightning Alert Site demo. Um, and like I said, if you, if you wanna learn more about Alert Site in general or you wanna give it a look, um, we'll have a, a few ways for you to do that. Um, awesome. And you, just real quick, you had mentioned um, retry logic. So when, let's say that something isn't performing well in one spot, so what would happen after that? Like to retry each monitor, what would that take? So, really, it would just take you clicking, selecting that preference. You wouldn't have to go in and do it yourself. No, no, not at all. So you have, um, we have a kind of two, two controls there. There is a setting on any monitor that allows you to do a, what we call a local retry. And what that does is if the monitor fails, it retries again from that same location before setting the, the success or fail value for that run. And, and that's all contained within the location uh, that, that, that it ran from in that interval. Um, so, you know, setting that will ensure that if it's just a blip in the app and you don't, you want to make sure it's really failing before you, you really set it to fail. Um, so that's a setting that a lot of folks use. Um, if you want to take that location kind of out of the mix exclusively to determine success and failure, uh, you, can, you can set it to retry um, what we call globally. And what that's going to do is it's going to retry from another location uh, around from the pool that you're using for that monitor. And do those, like, let's say you have one run that goes kind of wonky um, and it retries again and everything's fine. Does that show up on your dashboard tile? Like, would you be able to see that in your run history? It's in the run history. We don't, we don't make a big deal about it at the high level in the dashboard because that would be noisy. Although we are looking at some, putting some controls in here to potentially surface those things at a little higher level if you want to. But by default, if the run succeeds, it's green. Awesome. And you can control what determines if that run succeeds. Um, I like to run my monitors for the alert side platform with no retries because I want to know if it's, if any any yeah. blips if there's a blip i definitely want to know about it um but some folks you know they don't want to they, they really want it to fail hard before they um john lucania hello it's our, <laughs> our lead se just walked by the studio he opted to not join us for this session um but yeah you can control with a with a lot of degrees of granularity, whether or not that monitor fails or not. And that's, that's a really uh, valuable aspect to our platform and, and really lets you um, tailor it to, to your needs. So. Awesome. Which I feel like is a common <laughs> thread in what we like to say, but I think no, it's, 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 a, it's, it's literally, a true thing. yeah, it's exactly, it, I think it's honestly one of the most important things that people kind of forget about is when you have a new platform or a new tool that you have to kind of implement um, as, an, as an organization, um, it's super important to be able to have something that works for you, not necessarily something that you have to work with or work for or try and rework how you do stuff to get the data that you need. So I think it's something that's understated, but definitely important. No, and you know, to be honest, um, we have a lot of success um, with, with, you know, customers who come to us because there's too much noise in the platform they're using. Um, that, that's a big reason for people to switch, especially in sort of the advanced synthetic space. Yeah. Um, our platform is is cleaner. A lot of times people will start a trial with us and tell us that our, our system's broken. 
because they're not getting bombarded <laughs> with alerts. And uh, pretty much every time it turns out that, uh, no, it's not broken. It's that, you know, we have the ability to kind of cut through the noise and determine if the app's really working or not. So, so those are pretty critical, um, no doubt. All right, awesome. So we just want to give everybody kind of a, a wrap up here of why this is important and how this can help you um, from a bigger picture picture perspective, not just necessarily um, help your operations teams or, or necessarily help your um, design or development teams. Really give a an overhead view of how this works and why this is important. So um, from our view, reusing your files obviously helps streamline consistency and standardization, right? Like you put all of this effort into making sure that um, your formats or your definitions are aligned with everybody else in your development team and in your organization. But then from that point, it helps you, um, by reusing that, it helps you efficiently create monitors and take that standardization and consistency um, really across the entire API lifecycle rather than just um, within one department or it gets handed off and kind of that's the end of what happens with it, right? Um, and so from that point, it also promotes um, interoperability within your departments. You're really maximizing the amount that you can collaborate um, within your departments in your organization. And really being able to use the same file helps have a center um, of truth, right? Or a, a way that you can interact with one another um, in the most efficient way possible. And then from that, um, it just based off of that as well, like you can maximize your return for all of the um, tools that you have. You like you're already using one tool in development. Why not reuse that to help your operations team get up and running and um, stay consistent with the monitors that they have running? Um, and I I am not sure if anybody on this call or on this webinar was with us last week when we talked about how you can reuse um, or how you can use monitoring in your test environment. But that's a big piece of that as well so um yeah. if you're interested in seeing that just let us know because <laughs> we have it and um, it could be useful yes. to you yes indeed so on that point um one thing you know that we're seeing a lot more of is interest in in moving the monitor kind of left right back into the pre-production environments uh, and it, there's a lot of value um in doing that because you're able to uh kind of number one make sure the monitors are working uh make sure that you're test environments are working as they should be. Um, so you don't have any kind of issues with your, you know, testing environments being down and not knowing about it until your testers start working. And then you've, you've missed an opportunity to get some work done, which can be very inefficient. Um, the monitors breaking in production once an application changes can be a huge issue to the operations folks. Um, you're, you effectively go blind in production. You don't know whether your monitors are working or not. And everybody's scrambling trying to figure out, if it's a real problem or if it's not, how do I get those monitors working again? So, so monitoring at least the staging environment can be super helpful in that situation. Um, and then obviously you're gonna catch uh, application issues as well that may or may not come out of functional testing. Uh, performance based lining and things like that can be very valuable uh, from an ongoing perspective um, in those pre-production environments. So, so you know, synthetic monitoring is not just for production anymore is really what that's all about. And in particular, when you're talking about reusing these uh, these open API definitions, um, it, it all those benefits that we talked about up front apply to any one of these environments as well for creating monitors. Exactly, and it just makes the process a little bit easier, um, makes it more consistent, and then you can get up and running quickly, right? Like you don't have to go into um, trying to write new scripts to make a new monitor, um, especially if you're doing that in multiple stages it's super awesome to be able to reuse it and just get going yep. right from there all righty so we'll open up the floor for questions um if you guys want to write either in the chat or the q a um feel free to do that and we'll answer any questions that you may have so we have a question um can the tool read example json from the swagger document and or read a suggested assertion in the swagger using special extension tags Yes, that, that's a good question. Um, as of right now, we have a basic setup, uh, basic integration in place. What we want to do is, um, in in the next rev, is is start to to read more into those definitions and provide, uh, you know, 
better better clues and and, and obvious um, kind of next steps to enhance the um, the mana that you're creating from that endpoint. So we're definitely going to look at more of the more aspects of the definition um, when we create these monitors. So so stay tuned for that. So actually, <laughs> on the um, on the map that we had, Dennis, of the monitoring locations, there was one with your laptop and the Raspberry Pi. Do you want to explain what that was? Um, sure. So, so I mentioned that we have the ability to deploy um, private nodes to locations that are, are key to your applications and infrastructure. Uh, the, there's really kind of two flavors to that. We have a server um, product that lets you deploy it. The, an entire monitoring server, it's effectively the same code that we run on our public nodes that you can, uh, you can install in your environment. That can be installed as a virtual machine on um, VMware, Hyper-V, uh, Azure in the cloud, or, uh, or in AWS as an AMI. Uh, so that's a yeah, very robust solution. It's pretty, pretty straightforward to get that VM set up and running um, and you're off to the races. Uh, if you want to target an even you know more specific uh, location or endpoint, you can deploy our private node endpoint node onto any Mac, uh, Windows, or Linux machine in your environment. And what that does is lets you you know test from exactly where you want to test from. Uh, and sometimes locations don't have server environments, um, so it's not feasible to install one of our our node servers there. Uh, the private node endpoint is a great way to get to those locations. Sometimes you might have a lot of locations and it doesn't really make a lot of sense to deploy servers to all those locations. You may only want to run one or two monitors. So you can deploy the private endpoint to, to many locations if you have lots of retail stores, lots of campuses, remote workers, whatever makes, um, whatever makes sense, uh, you can deploy it there. So that's what those are all about. I actually, uh, so we have a little Raspberry Pi zero computer that we set up as a monitor just to show how lightweight that agent is and it can even run on that Pi. Um, not too many monitors, but, but it does work. Um, and then I've got them running on my, my personal machines here at home and uh, a bunch of other machines around the company. So we, we use it ourselves to, to test, for example, how our Wi-Fi is doing here in, in Somerville, Mass. <laughs> Which has helped immensely just to you know, throw that out there. Because when I first got here, it was it was real wacky. It was, we were yes. having some issues. <laughs> I, I will say that one, one definite tangible benefit of that private node endpoint is that our Wi-Fi is better. <laughs> um, so yes, that was, that was a win for sure. A little internal uh, case study. <laughs> um, someone else is asking about SOAP UI. So um, I'm not sure if we have, maybe let's just go back into what that looks like. Like, can you reuse um, SOAP UI tests? Yeah, like so like I was saying, um, once you create your test cases in SOAP UI and, and they're in a project, um, that project file can be exported from SOAP UI and can be used as the starting point to create a monitor. And, and then once you import the project, uh, you get to choose which test case you want to use to make a monitor. And that can be a single step or it can be a multi-step monitor based on what's in the test case itself. For... Uh, folks who are in SOAP UI or Ready API interfaces themselves, you can upload the, the, the test case directly as a monitor right from those interfaces um, using the, uh, the, the monitor API tab in those products. So, so from the SOAP UI or Ready API interface is yep. what you mean? Yeah. So e either you can come at it from either direction, but, but the end result will be a monitor that, that's running an alert site, um, you know, and kind of depicted as a tile, if you will, on that, on that dashboard. Awesome. So if anybody else has any more questions, um, feel free to send them in. I'll wait a couple more seconds. And if nobody else has any questions, um, I'll let you guys give you, get, give you guys back um, some time in your day. Um, and as we mentioned before, um, if you want to try this for yourself or if you want to have any more resources in terms of like how to start API monitoring, what it is, what the benefits are, um, or in general, just any, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. My email should be on your registration invites. Um, and just as um, 
a heads up, we are recording this and we'll send it out um, within the next 48 hours or so. So you should get that in your inbox. Um, feel free to either rewatch it if you want to or share it with anybody um, that you feel may be interested in this. But otherwise, um, if there is no other questions, thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, I hope you have a great rest of the day. And it was great talking with you guys. Thanks a lot. Thanks.